What I want to talk to you about is uh, where is traceability today in the international markets? We've talked about this for a number of years, and this is probably one of the areas where we have um, competition from time to time. We may have some deficiencies. Uh, we just recently completed a study that I'll show you the results on, on, on how that may have been, uh, how that might affect us, and maybe some of your decision-making policy. Right off the bat, I want to make uh, everybody aware that USMEF does not set is not out to prescribe any particular type of traceability. That's what livestock organizations and, and organizations like NIIA should be doing. Uh, we just want to tell you what's going on and uh, how we're perceived in the marketplace today and, and how different governments might look at us uh, through this. So we're not out here to prescribe any particular kind of um, traceability program. <clears throat> I think first we ought to talk just about globalization, what that is and, and how that affects us. Uh, I think a lot of times people may think this is globalization, is just getting products out of the country. Then the other extreme is that there is a lot of policy and political issues that go on for globalization, just the commercial side. Look how many businesses we think of as being American businesses that now are really global businesses. Maybe it's just what MEF does, is we try to merchandise U.S. products in foreign markets. Maybe it's big pharmaceutical companies. I find this one to be very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> most of the compounds we use in our animals today, particularly the growth promotants, they're made in places like Europe where they're banned, but they're made in that country. So that's kind of an interesting t twist on uh, how globalization can, can work out. It's all about the economics, I guess. Is it about these big guys out there that are, have businesses all over the world? Is it diversification in the kind of production you have? This is swine production in Spain where they're feeding them the acorns for that specialized pork product. Or is it more te high technology and similar to what we're used to in the United States, but maybe in a foreign country? Can't forget sustainability. That's probably one of the things I've had to add to the list uh, in the last year or so, is that that uh, has become uh, a big topic in that we're actually seeing companies want to go all the way back and understand what's going on in those countries. Well, that may be a component of traceability. What about genetics? Of course, that's probably a big piece, is how genetics is spread around the world today. I've heard some people say that, you know, genetics is fairly uniform, particularly in pork production, if we went worldwide. Either way we look at it, it's, it's a lot of money. Uh, the world today has about, <clears throat> we get about $200 a head from beef in the international markets, and that's about 12 to 15 percent of our production. It's about $60 a head in pork, and that's somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of our production. So it's pretty important to us in the bottom line. I think the first place to start is, <clears throat> how is, uh, how is traceability used in the international markets? So I broke it down in a couple ways. One is regulatory. I think the way we most commonly think about it is for animal disease uh, control mechanisms. But certainly there are recall capabilities that are a part of that. And I think in the world today we're starting to maybe confuse traceability to product tracking. And maybe some of the things we need to do is delineate between the two. And that brings up the big question, do they need to be connected together? Is there really a need to connect those uh, two things together? <clears throat> Private standards, this is a growing one. And this is one that I tell our groups, uh, be cautious of this one. We're seeing a lot of change in the way private companies are going to be handling these things. We already know about animal welfare and food safety. We've had product quality and specifications coming, but we also know that there may be sustainability pieces that the private sector may be asking us to do. And likewise, there can be commercial pieces. Which I'll show you some stuff later. It's interesting to me how much uh, commercialization there is in the traceability piece. There are world standards. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the WTO is pretty simple. Uh, it just can't be too uh, restrictive. It must be scientifically based. And an importing country can't impose anything more difficult than what they're doing on the people that are importing into the country. OIE in uh, 2007, they adopted two chapters that deal strictly with traceability. I think you're all familiar with those. We won't cover those. That's probably for another time, or you all are probably much more informed on what those actually are than I am. Uh, and then Codex. The Codex uh, <clears throat> Committee on Food Import and Export Sp uh, Inspection and Certification Systems, theirs primarily deals with uh, trace back or, or uh, product tracing. Uh, but also has some other features in there that would relate to animal disease traceability. Dare I say that this is a, a standard? I won't. Um, but certainly is one that does set some precedents out there because so many countries want to get into the European Union. So they basically have to follow a, 
a scheme that's very similar to the passport that Europe uses domestically. Kind of falls back onto those WTO rules. So uh, they kind of set a little bit of precedence here and there on some things. <clears throat> Not necessarily do on their retail labels say a whole lot about that live animal. They tell where the product was uh, uh, slaughtered and then where it was cut, but don't necessarily say a lot about the animal, even though there's supposed to be a record of that uh, out there. Uh, I think what will happen, though, is that what they're looking at is moving that scheme into the barcoding system, which we're all very, very familiar with. Virtually everything you buy has a, bar a barcode on it. And what they're looking at doing is moving that back into the live animal sector, which is kind of an interesting uh, feature. This UCC, or excuse me, that's what we used to call it, the GS1-128 is the code that's universally used for almost all wholesale products. Meat, the meat industry has been doing it for over 25 years. It's there, it's in place. There's a lot of features that it can do. It does everything from invoicing to money collections at banks. It's a very useful tool. The Europeans are looking at doing that all the way back to the live animals. I think the question that needs to be asked is in this interface between the carcass and the cuts, is there a need for the traceability to move into the products? We, all, we already realize it needs to be uh, the way back, uh, from the carcass back, but does it need to move forward? We all know that would be difficult in the United States just the way we process. In Europe, I've seen them do it. They have the ability to keep that uh, individual animal intact all the way to the, to the packages. They can't slaughter it much more than a couple hundred head an hour at the best. Uh, so it's difficult to keep those all uh, together. Plus, the number of cuts they produce is much, much fewer than what we have. So that makes it even more uh, difficult for us to move into that kind of a format. But something certainly for us to, to think about and consider. Private standards, as I said, I think this is one we need to take a look at. I think as time goes on, we're seeing more and more influence from the private sector on certain standards. We know these three guys down the bottom set some standards on animal welfare. They set standards for food safety. They certainly could set a standard relative to traceability. And I think it's something that we need to, to consider. Now, <clears throat> what is their dilemma? Their dilemma is that they're everywhere. And if you look at this list of, of eight, and it's a fairly old list, so I imagine it's even bigger with more countries. Over here on this side are abbreviations of the different countries they have stores in. So which standard do they work with? What country standard do they use? They probably won't. They'll probably come up with one of their own that is at a lower common denominator than what they can get in a country. So I think it's something we need to keep aware of. Do note that many of those are in the United States. They have stores here in the United States, and they're not just small ones. Obviously, Walmart at the top of the list is huge in this country, and they are setting private standards out there for us. So needless to say, the time could be that uh, we could see that uh, come up. So I'm not saying it will. I'm just uh, having you put that down in your notes. It's something that uh, we certainly want to think about as we move forward. That also lends us to the fact that <clears throat> A standard probably have to be under an international format. And today we have that under the ISO format. Within the United States, we use the process verified programs. And I'll show you in a minute that all the programs we have that are related to exporting and traceability actually have are part of the USDA process verified system. So one way or another, it will probably be which that is part of the ISO system or uses the ISO standards. So. I think we're going to probably see more, in that, more and more of that happen is whether we move towards some private standards or we see more regulatory um, movement. The three programs we have today for exporting, you're all very familiar with. Uh, a lot of that uh, are there because of a disease we had called BSE. And uh, we have a program in Japan where they have to verify the age and source of that animal. Keep your fingers crossed that may be changing this year. Uh, where the age portion may be uh, going away because the Japanese government may move from where you have to certify that the animals were 20 months of age to where they are just 30 months of age, which we have a standard procedure for doing that um, today. So that one may, may change a little bit. However, some survey work we've done kind of show that maybe uh, the commercial side are interested in the source piece. Source is an interesting concept that a lot of markets find value in. They like to know how these animals were produced and what went into them. And in our business of advertising U.S. products, we use that 
a lot. We, we have no problem showing farrowing barns in, in the middle of Iowa or ranches in Montana, and that sells products for us as, as we do that. So things about source can have value. Um, a growing market for us is EU. Uh, like I said earlier, we have to follow basically their format. We don't have to use exactly a passport, but we do have to have a birth origin for both our pork program, which is PFEU and NHTC, is non-hormone treated cattle program, uh, which that program is going to grow in August to over double the size of the quota we have today. We're going to move from 20,000 metric tons to 48,200 metric tons with a few conditions um, to get there. But it's growing. It's been a good market for us. Uh, they, they have a lot of value, and as long as that euro keeps, and we had a little, little uh, flubber a few months ago where it got a little bit soft, but now it's starting to separate from the U.S. dollar, and that will make that a, a very lucrative uh, 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 market for us. In Hong Kong, they, they asked if you can uh, certify back to, the, back to slaughter. That's a common one and a fairly easy one for us to do because you basically have an invoice or a, a billing of some sort that said it was sold from a feedlot to a, to a packing house. That's fairly easy, or a finishing barn to, to the plant. So that's a relatively easy piece of traceability. Uh, now we'll get into uh, to the study, and I, you can't believe how lucky I am today. In fact, I'm going to go get a lottery ticket right after this, because we did this study, and the, one of the researchers is in the room with us, Dr. Constance, right here. Uh, so if you have any questions, if I said it wrong, I'm sure he'll correct everything, and he'll take all your questions on, on these studies. <clears throat> in 2006, um, a study was carried out just to understand where we stood in the rural rel world relative to uh, traceability. Best way to read this chart is those things in pink have mandatory uh, individual ID and record movement, where they can uh, watch where the, the animals went. So anything in pink has those. Remember, this is 2006. Anything in green, they, uh, they have some, some voluntary programs and a mixture of voluntary and mandatory programs in some of the key areas, which would be movement or possibly ID. Anything in white pretty much has a voluntary program. You can see we are, the U.S. is in that, that category, along with New Zealand, Nambia, and Mexico. Well, we wanted to know, did that change? So we chartered a study with uh, some universities, Kansas State, Colorado State, and Montana State, and they looked uh, more in depth into this uh, uh, this concept. And what we did here, I really tried to simplify the, the uh, chart so that you can get one glance, get a pretty good idea of what's going on. Down on your left are the, the various countries. These are our trading partners. These are the importers. And across the top are some of those similar uh, criteria. A mandatory program, animal, individual animal ID, what type of ID system, which is what kind of ear tag, and then do they require animal movement and tracking. And you can see pretty much all of our trading partners have a program. So if you go back and think about the WTO rule I listed, they do have the, the right to impose traceability under their conditions upon the importers. Now, not really any of those guys have done that with the exception of the EU. Okay? We noticed that Mexico is, does not have a mandatory program, but they are working on one. Uh, I'm not sure when they're going to get that up. I've heard uh, 2017, though. What about our competition? Well, most of our competition have mandatory programs uh, for the various attributes. Down here on this right side kind of talks about the reason they do it. It's mainly animal disease reasons. Um, and you can see we stick out a little bit. We don't have uh, any of those kind of programs. Now, we have some that are in, in, in progress, and I'm not real sure where we're at on those at, you know, at, at this point in time. but. We, uh, it kind of makes us look a little bit rough there that um, maybe we're a little bit better than India, all joking aside, but uh, uh, it gives you a pretty good, pretty good idea. Now, that doesn't say that we don't have access. We still have access. So I thought one of the neat analyses that the researchers did is they <clears throat> looked at kind of what the degree of access we had or lack of access we had is actually how you look at it. Again, down on the left, you have the... the uh, exporting countries, and across the top are the various importing countries. 
the best way to read that chart is if there's a whole bunch of writing in a blank or a, a, a red circle, you got to hop over hurdles to get into that market. Whereas if you have the green zero, you don't have a lot of hurdles. You've got pretty much open access. So for the United States, we do have access in a lot of those countries. We don't have it in China yet, but keep your fingers crossed. But notice how many extra things we have to do. Now that just uh, says that we are at a disadvantage to our competitor who has an open door to get in, or it costs us more to be in that market. And the cost is probably the bigger factor there. We have the access, we just have to do more. And those fundamentally are export verification programs that we have to do, and, and we know those can be expensive for us to, to be in that market. The bottom ones down here, you can see that some of the countries are restricted by, for FMD controls in a lot of different places. Um, and, uh, but then there's a few of our bigger ones that, that because they, they have a traceability program and, and some other things, they can get into those markets. Please don't read this chart as this being the only reason we don't have access. There's a lot of other reasons on why we have access, but the way the researchers looked at it, this is some of the fundamentals that keep us out, or no, I shouldn't say it that way, that uh, keep us limited in getting some of those, those markets. Uh, our membership asked us, well, can you do that? Because that was pretty much a beef analysis. Could you do that for pork? And we sure can. We're in the middle of doing that right now. We haven't got it quite done. We'll have it done here in the next uh, few months. But under the same ideas that we'll have, I'll look at it from mandatory, um, an ID system, movement, and then why you would be doing that. And we'll try and have those pulled together. We're trying to get data for some of these countries down here. We do, uh, are doing that for um, the exporting countries. You can see the U.S. actually may be in a little bit better shape because we have had some programs in place since actually, since actually 1988. So the picture may look a little bit different for our pork when we, than uh, what we did um, with our beef model. Moving ahead, let's kind of look at what's happening in these markets. So I think we fully understand that uh, a lot of these markets have programs. That doesn't necessarily mean we're out of their market or we're banned from their market. We may have some limitations that uh, cost us a little more to, to play, uh, play big in that market, and that's uh, kind of what I want to talk about here today. In Japan, <clears throat> as you know, they have a mandatory program for their beef. Uh, this is one in which they uh, test all of their beef at 20 months of age. We hope they'll be moving that to 30 months of age here in the very near future. In some places, uh, you can go on a website, and if you want to know the meat you're buying, there's a number in the case or on the package, you can go to a website and you can get this report right here. And it tells you that that animal was tested. And of course he was free of BSE. You can also do that in a store with a kiosk and you can see the numbers there underneath the green sign. That's the animal number. It's still confusing to me how they can keep it so accurate and know exactly how those cuts fit, can be traced back to that exact carcass. I just find that to be very difficult in, in, in about any kind of a, a slaughtering uh, procedure. This is some anecdotal survey information out of China. Oops, out of China. And it's kind of interesting that there's such, notice the percentage on the side that that's only 25%, that basically the peak there are 30%. Those people really don't pay a whole lot of attention to any kind of particular certification or branding at all in that country. They're just not knowledgeable in, the, in that kind of information at this stage of the game. So it's pretty low level information uh, about safety certificates and you can see those across the bottom, whether green food or organic food or inspection exempted or things of that nature. So in China, the, the knowledge about that is, is, is fairly low. Taking that a little bit further, you can see that really the place they buy, venue is the place they buy, has more impact on them than, than anything. What I find amazing is certificate over here. Look how low it is. A cert certificate, a uh, stamp of the government, a uh, good housekeeping seal of China or whatever doesn't mean a whole lot to them. So in those countries, those things are, are not very valuable. But we are seeing some of the people follow, some of the uh, uh, production companies follow the same format there is in Japan, where people can go to a, a place for information that may be useful to them. Notice how big that billboard is. It's absolutely huge. Um, you can't quite see it. There's a person standing there. And you can see it. That's probably about a uh, four-by-eight sheet of plywood 
that sign. And uh, then you have a big screen uh, kiosk there to go get information. It's funny, some, some buyers will, will, will go ahead and, and get information uh, because they are information hunger. I think the younger they are, they tend to do that. This isn't necessarily talking about a specific animal as much as it's just the information about the product line. And this is called Star Farm. Again, I find it interesting that they do show the rolling hills, the countryside with the grass, and things like that. So, so it's, again, talking about that source. In Taiwan, <clears throat> they do have a program. It, it's a uh, uh, rather interesting program. They call it TAP, Traceable Agricultural Products. It's for all products. Um, as you might guess, those products tend to be more expensive, so some of the uh, producers thinks that, you know, because they don't sell as quick or they don't sell as, as, uh, as well as others, they should be subsidized because of the, the price differentials. So it's kind of counterintuitive what they're, uh, they're doing there. But, uh, again, another country that uh, it is a large uh, meat-consuming country, but they are showing the signs that they, uh, they have uh, tra traceability needs, if you will. These are more domestic-type programs, but certainly could be something uh, of interest to our, to our business. Thailand, this is strictly a commercial business. It's called Beta Grow, and they're basically merchandising uh, their products through this system. Uh, they're traceable, all kinds of products. It's almost like you can become a member of this group and, and be entitled to some of these things. So this, this is the type of uh, traceability that's more commercially uh, oriented rather than the government uh, putting something forward. In South America, we're seeing a lot more of these type of certifications. They're probably more commercially driven rather than government driven. Uh, we understand this is fairly new information, but uh, the Brazilian government is going to turn their efforts over to the, to the uh, public sector to develop the traceability system. So it'll be interesting to watch how that, that, uh, that moves there. Again, that will be an interesting uh, situation for them because they are a big shipper to the EU. And I have a hard time believing that the, the EU would accept that as a private system. They're going to want some kind of government oversight. So it'll be interesting to watch how that, that changes. That's called SISBOV, S-I-S-B-O-V. It's interesting the way the Uruguayans uh, use the grass, folding into a uh, barcode that all the way from the energy the animal takes in goes right to the consumer plate. So uh, kind of an interesting concept they have. Again, these, uh, these systems are, are much smaller than uh, their whole cattle herd or their pork herd. And uh, it's going to be, you know, challenging for them to get those, those products into some kind of a, a scheme. And again, they've got to rely on, on the public who are actually in the business of doing that uh, to get these things started. So it's kind of interesting the, the way they're, uh, they're thinking about these, these traceability programs. Competitive advertising, definitely out there. Uh, the one is the Canadians. And the other one is from Australia. These are full page now, full page ads in trade magazines and papers talking about their traceability programs and how they work and how successful they are. And uh, again, they do give the image of the source with the pastures and, of course, the mountains from, uh, from Canada. But they directly compete with MEF on these on these uh, programs. Traceability you can trust. Probably all of you are familiar with our campaign in, in Korea called To Trust. That is a food safety campaign to trust that you should have trust in our meat products after the BSE dilemma. We care. The second one that we've, uh, we have in Japan, those are direct comp competition because Australia knows we don't have a program. They know they can't beat the quality of beef because grain fed is much higher priced and has higher demand, but what they're trying to do is edge in and say that traceability, because the U.S. doesn't have it, that's something you should consider. Because that, do they, you know, do they really have that good of food safety? And so they're using that component against us, and, and we see that every day with uh, these kind of campaigns and programs. Okay, I want to show you a video that I've been showing for about the last ten years. This video, like I said, I, I, I've shown it for about ten years now. And what it is, it's for a cell phone. And uh, the, it's a young man that is, is shopping with his baby, picks up the baby food jar, takes his phone, takes a snapshot of the barcode, 
goes directly to a, a website, and he gets all the information he wants on the baby food. Ten years ago, that's commonplace today. Everywhere. You can do that on all kinds of stuff. You can do that all you want. And that's the, the other beauty of this is the ability to provide people information at hand. And that's what they thrive worldwide is having that information. So that is another component that has really become a commercialized relative to traceability is that the fact that uh, you can get information. I think traceability just becomes a tool in that, that piece because I'm not really sure to the question Lori asked, do they really want to know that specific animal? Or do they really want to know what you did behind all of your production? And I think that's probably more of uh, what we're looking at relative to, to actual traceability. So there is a big commercial component relative uh, to all of those things. It's really interesting to me that, uh, especially in the purebred, and I'm sure this is true in a lot of the uh, purebred businesses, that you uh, take that little barcode, turn that on, you get to see a video of that, that heifer or, or whatever. So it's really effective marketing. Again, information readily available to you and uh, to that. And that's just in a, in a bull sale catalog for that ranch. So it's a, it's a huge tool. It's uh, becoming widely used throughout the world. Our websites have those on them now. So people can go to our website when we put our various stickers on, on various promotions that we have worldwide. So in summary, I think some things that we can glean out of what's happening today is that uh, traceability can be a regulatory program, but they may grow into some private uh, uh, standards. So the question is, does private standard drive regulatory, or does regulatory drive uh, private standards? Like, sorry to say this, but is it the chicken or the egg, which we heard a lot about just a minute ago? You know, which, which way is, is, is it out there? I think we're going to see... Uh, quite a bit of the private standards uh, uh, taking place in the next few years. And I think traceability could be a component of that. I don't think you'll see necessarily them specifically saying traceability. It's going to be tied to probably something else, disease control, uh, animal welfare, food safety, something of that nature. Most trading partners have mandatory domestic trading uh, traceability programs, and some countries impose uh, these uh, requirements on imports. We really haven't seen that heavily done yet. Uh, so that's just one of the things we've got to keep in our basket and know that their programs are WTO compliant. They could require us to do that at any point in time. Uh, most competitors have mandatory programs and they are currently actively advertising about that uh, to get an edge on, on the business we have because we have such high quality products that we put in the marketplace that are um, very economical to purchase.